thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we've got our uh, panelists all named up there, but I want to just kind of dive into the conversation here because um, we hear the word blockchain, and Chris and I talked about it this morning. Uh, you go to a lot of tech conferences, you hear the buzzword, and then it becomes, well, what exactly does this mean for this specific sector? So I want to start with a big round on that. Um, with an opening round question to all of you, why do we need blockchain in education? And Chris, we'll start with you. Uh, for one purpose, uh, the, ver the convenient verification of credentials um, that are learner owned and vendor independent. Um, I add those two last caveats because um, sometimes people use the word blockchain to mean the magical solution that will fix whatever problem they're having. Yeah. Um, and it's definitely not that. It is a technology that does something specific. Um, it's a global notary that can verify the ownership of digital assets, including money, or in this case, academic credentials. Um, but there's lots of ways to go about doing that. And as a company at Learning Machine, we believe that the real value of it is maximized when you do it in a way that students can demonstrate ownership of the credential cryptographically, and when those credentials will verify for a lifetime, even if the vendor goes away, even if the school goes away, it's a permanent digital object that can always be verified. So the blockchain together with the web and mobile, we now have the perfect combination, a, a perfect social fabric to create a new kind of credential. Okay, Chris B. Yes, thank you. Um, so Chris has hit on a lot of great points. I think one thing that Microsoft sees is blockchain also helps to bridge from a student in their academic world into the workforce. So as we're looking at employment challenges or opportunities, we're also looking at how do we make sure that people coming out of the academic world have got the right skills being built and developed for the future, and how can we validate that? And blockchain provides a great technology solution to that in terms of being able to provide that kind of credential that is um, student and learner owned. But you also start thinking about how do employers for the future start looking at their own employees today, start validating their credentials within their own institution? How do we look at this being a global phenomenon and how do we support movement of people um, across cities, across systems, across countries? And you need something that's independent of any one institution. And blockchain starts to come in as a great technology, digital ledger um, technology in general comes in as a great solution. But you look at the broad problems that we've got with unemployment and it's really uh, a great technology to start providing that connection with skills in a way that you know, Chris has already talked with the student piece. Well, the Chris's have spoken well. <laughs> Let me uh, try to provide a different context here. Uh, when the problem that we were trying to solve is slightly different. Uh, when three major Dallas institutions came together, they told me in a simple word, the problem that they were trying to solve was the handshake problem. They said. You know, when students transition from high school to college, uh, community college to four-year institutions, or from four-year institutions or high schools to employment, that's where the biggest drop-off happens. And so they asked, how can we actually make this transition seamless and easy? And we looked at it and we said, uh, obviously, uh, the paper flow that the registrars are used to, uh, or the paper flow when you're applying to a job, uh, so I would say LinkedIn is an honor system, so you know, when you're actually applying to a job, if you can have a verified system in place, uh, that would certainly make it a lot more easier, and the blockchain would be a great solution to do that. But our problem was actually very different. When we looked at the students, we found that in Dallas Independent School District, the vast majority of students are coming from economically disadvantaged, underprivileged backgrounds, and they have uh, a lot of challenges getting access to high-quality advisors who can actually help them get into college, or for that matter, into take credentialing, uh, short-term credentialing courses that can actually get them better jobs. So we stepped back and said, what is a technology that we can implement that can change the dynamic? Can actually, rather than you working with your high school advisors to get into college, can through a, a different system, college advisors find you, or employers find you, and so thereby making the transitions a lot more easier and seamless. And that's what blockchain can do because you can have a unified record, uh, especially within a closed ecosystem. It's a lot more easier to do that. I want to get um, a bit more in into um, specific use case over in, in Dallas, but, but Matt, you know, how much of this in terms of the increasing use of blockchain technology in education is a symptom of you know, more liquidity, as we say, within 
the sector. So more and more people are getting additional certificates. Uh, students are a lot more mobile, transferring from community college to four-year universities. Yep. How much of that has driven the growth that we've seen here? I think, well, first of all, I think we're still very early in the actual adoption of blockchain, <laughs> either directly through institutions developing solutions themselves or working with service providers in partnership to them. We hit on a lot of the key drivers in terms of permanence, in terms of verification, an exchange platform. Uh, but I think you hit another piece of it that's really important, which is uh, individuals earn many different credentials throughout their life course. And that's true as you move within K-12, student transfers on the rise within K-12. The typical higher ed student will attend more than one institution, which Manoj was um, speaking to in terms of credit transfer. And then you bring in industry and professional credentials. So another attribute of the blockchain, which I think is really well-timed to how education is evolving, is what you raised, which is the typical individual earning many different kinds of credentials. And so the ability of blockchain to act as a distributed ledger, many different organizations can write around a single unified identity securely so that we can build a more cumulative record, I think is another really important and attractive piece. And then it brings the final component, at least for me, which is the capabilities of smart contracts, which is if you have a platform where these records are being written, things like credit transfer and how do I evaluate you know, if I took this course here, whether I'm gonna get credit there, much of that is also hidden behind the firewall of institutions. I think hopefully we'll get into smart contracts and what it can do as well. As you pointed out, we're still in the very early stages of this technology. If you look at how things are transacted right now, you talk about the credit transfers, yep. uh, having to get transcripts and that kind of thing. Without the technology in place, um, What's the one element that you think is, is really the big hiccup? Is it the lack of efficiency? Is it the verification element? Um, what is the biggest problem with the current system that's in place? So I think that's one of the factors, the answer to that, that I think is gonna ultimately pace adoption, which is candidly, a digital diploma issued with a blockchain component is no functionally better in any immediate sense, and, and maybe this will be an area of of disagreement, I hope so, it'll make for kind of an interesting conversation, but it's no functionally better for the learner. If I have a digital diploma that's written to the blockchain and I have a digital diploma that's provided through a PDF with blue ribbon protection, both are tamper evident, both I can look at in a mobile app, both I can put in my LinkedIn profile, both I can use as a mechanism of degree verification. There's no regulatory context that says I trust the blockchain more than I trust. So. I think like any, and I know blockchain is not an open standard, that's not the right way to think about it, but it's analogous in a sense that where blockchain starts to improve the way credentialing works is when an ecosystem adopts it. And when all of a sudden an applicant tracking system can automatically ping you know, the blockchain to verify the degree. But absent the ecosystem, the early adoptions are no functionally better than the current state. And so I think that's gonna pace adoption I happen to believe credit transfer, smart contracts, exchange, that's where we're gonna actually see something that is better than the current state as a directly attributable blockchain can do. Um, but absent that, candidly, a blockchain credential is no better or worse than I'm gonna push state. back. <laughs> so, uh, my, my pushback is that, you know, some of the early adopters of Greenlight uh, were just that, they were early adopters. I mean, without an ecosystem in place. And the question was, would they benefit? Would the Dallas County Community Colleges benefit if there was 50 other institutions that would accept their you know, credentials? Yes, but on the flip side, if you design the technology in a way, and that's how we have done, where the institution can park the credentials and that can be instantly verified by a third party when the student sends it out, you don't need an ecosystem in place. However, you, what you need to do is maybe piggyback on uh, uh, Matt's parchment, uh, you know, the parchment receiver network as an example, to have uh, institutions basically willing to easily adopt these, these platforms. So my pushback is only on the fact that I think you're gonna see very soon uh, increasingly more and more institutions being willing to adopt this technology because let's be, let's be honest, I asked this question to myself when I started this business. Would I be happy to have all of my credentials and I went to high school and college in India before I came here. 
in one place that I could instantly shoot it over to a third party person and that person would know that it's verified? The answer is yes, absolutely yes. I could go to the colleges that I went to in India and I could ask them to basically write their credentials into my, wall, into my locker. I don't need an ecosystem for that and I could share that instantly with a third party person. So my, my thinking is that I think over the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, I think we're gonna get a few more converts in this industry, we're gonna see more institutions basically coming on board to park their credentials in the green light or onto other platforms. Let, let me get your thoughts because you um, are an early, early mover in the space. If you look at use cases so far, are there early adopters that you think have been able to use it in a way that is functionally better than the current system that exists? And can you point to some of those use cases? I mean, absolutely. There's lots of technical advantages over you know, Adobe Blue Ribbon technology. If that were the case, you know, why aren't we all using it? Nobody, you know, people basically don't trust it. It's not very popular. Um, and there's several security advantages that blockchain brings, and I don't want to get too in the weeds, but from independent time stamping to not having a single point of failure. I mean, if you look at, um, the, you know, I, I hate to use an extreme example, but, you know, in the refugee crisis, when institutions get wiped out, and, and they're the only institutions that can verify the credential, um, people can no longer prove who they are. What the blockchain provides is a more robust, redundant system so that there's no single point of failure for the verification of records. Um, yes, in a perfect world where everything is working perfectly and, all, and the institutions never collapse or go out of business um, and everyone trusts proprietary blue ribbon technology and that's the default system for the world, then in that theoretical universe, it's no, it's no better. But that's not the world we live in. Um, it is early in the adoption cycle uh, and we are already, um, We've been in, in market for several years, not just with individual institutions like everyone from MIT to community colleges, but with entire countries like the Republic of Malta or, or uh, um, uh, official test scores through the Caribbean Examination Council that provides official examination results for students across 19 different countries that use these results to apply for jobs. This is not like some theoretical future. This is already something that customers are moving towards. It is early and it is gonna be more and more effective the more the ecosystem adopts it, absolutely. Yeah. I wanna see if we can hone in on, on the approach that Learning Machine has taken and specifically looking at block certs, block certs, which is open source and open standard. Why take that specific approach? Right, when, when we started this technology, talking about it back in 2015 with MIT, we knew that <clears throat> we shouldn't take a proprietary approach. We didn't wanna create a world where there were silos and dependency on certain vendors or certain technologies, because those never last. They always get disrupted by open standards. So when we put the first code out in the world for how to do this, we did it in a way that was open source so that anyone could expect and do it for themselves. We did it in a way that was aligned with other pre-existing data standards. And the goal uh, was to pursue this new technology in a way that would not result in new silos. Because if it was some learning machine format um, it, you know, we're, we're back where we started. The whole point is to give people ownership of their credentials in a way, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record in here, but that is vendor independent, meaning if that vendor goes away, they can still use their credentials, they'll still verify, even if the institution goes away. Right now you have a lot of credential providers which provide excellent services, but it's essentially a walled garden, and the credentials only work within that garden. And that's a vulnerable place to be, and as education becomes decentralized and, and the registrar of the four-year institution is no longer the center of, this, of the student's learning universe, but in fact they're, they're getting credentials from a wide universe, uh, universe of education providers, the student is really the only one in the proper place to be the registrar of all of the lifetime of learning and achievement. Um, and blockchain works great whenever you have this many-to-many -many relationship where you have many institutions issuing credentials and you've got many institutions needing to verify credentials um, and there's no central authority, no central clearinghouse that can really operate across all venues. This, this, this global infrastructure is really the first uh, thing we've had that, that will allow for that. Yeah. Uh, Chris, let me ask you um, how Microsoft has approached this. It, it's, I think, you're in a unique position in that you've got this, you, you work for a massive tech company that's yep. invested a lot in blockchain, also had investments in higher learning. How do you bring those together and what are the real life problems right now that you think that type of technology could, 
could address. Yeah, I think, so Microsoft does play the kind of platform role in the space, so with our cloud technologies, obviously we're, we're in there. But one of the big challenges that Microsoft's looking at globally is how do we get the right skills into the workforce to keep the economies growing all around the world. Um, when we start thinking about professional certifications, blockchain plays a perfect role with smart contracts that can trigger at credential expiry every year if you're an optometrist, let's say. Um, you start to actually build that kind of credential system that's intelligent enough to be able to go back to the assessment and the tracking side. So we're looking at, from a skills development standpoint, this opens new doors and new ways that we can actually track, trigger, and control that sort of um, skills platform. But the broader challenge is how do employers actually validate that people have the skills that they say that they have? As we keep you know, bringing students out of the uh, education system that may not have the right skills for the workforce, um, we're seeing more instances of people creating LinkedIn profiles that are not accurate or talking about uh, a school that they went to that they did not attend. We're seeing that raise major challenges for employers. So as we're trying to help employers get better at sourcing the right kind of individuals and candidates to continue growing the economy, blockchain or digital letter has got to be a part of that solution. Yeah. Um, you know, every learning platform at some point needs to be able to say a student actually did this test or this piece of work and we can actually prove it. Um, we're just gonna see that become fundamental very shortly. And with platforms like LinkedIn, um, that's where you're gonna see these credentials start to show up and, and really mean something. Matt, you know, what we've heard a lot in terms of um, how to use this technology, tracking and verifying, uh, something that we hear over and over. Um, Chris just pointed to how that benefits schools as well as employers. What about on the other end? If you are in fact an employer or employee, a worker in the workforce looking for a job, how does having that all on you know, one ledger, how does that benefit you? Well, I think it's, it's in what Chris and others have already raised, um, uh, Chris is, uh, excuse me, <laughs> um, have already raised. You know, my ability to more easily collect across the different education and training providers where I've earned credentials, even something as simple as, you know, credit transfer, many students don't recognize or remember all the credits that they've earned. They don't know how to navigate the system to get access to those transcripts from the various institutions where they've earned it. So that ability to rely on, you know, in one cohesive identity or unified identity for me, I think that has huge functional benefits. Um, and to do it in a way that's verified, where I can communicate my credentials to you, I don't need the institution involved, and I don't lose any of the trust or verification behind it. Mm -hmm. What's the, the economic slash business case for it? Uh, for, the, for the job applicant or for the employer? For both. Um, so for the job applicant, I presume, it's getting the job. Um, uh, I mean, I want to think about it a little bit more, but it's getting the job, and it's just, you know, the friction behind what I just talked about, navigating the documentation. I mean, if I'm a doctor, um, I typically have two or three people in my office responsible for just credentialing with hospitals, national boards, and otherwise. So there's a strong economic interest to rationalize that system. If I'm the employer, it's the ability to reduce credential fraud. Now, you know, how much of an economic cost it really is that I hired Matt, who said he had a bachelor's degree from American and didn't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. There's regulatory risk if it's in a profession where that matters and that creates exposure, supply chains, things of that nature. Um, and then again, it's the operational efficiency of being able to collect and verify the relevant credentials as an employer. So we've kind of established what the applications are. Um, and yet, with any early technology, there's always some challenges that lie ahead. And Manoj, I'm wondering if you can speak to this in terms of um, some of the hiccups that, at least in Dallas, that you've seen, what we've heard over and over at, with blockchain is, is scalability and then the cost associated with it as well. Um, how have you seen the school system adapt to that? And are there other challenges that you see that could really make this difficult to go on a mass scale. Right. You know, the, the early institutions that came on board, they enrolled over 300,000 students, and they wanted alumni all the way back to 1965, their records to be put on the platform. So you're looking at millions of student records uh, on, on Greenlight. And so we, when we started this, K, uh, this project, we evaluated whether we should have a public blockchain um, uh, like uh, learning machine or whether we should stay on the private, uh, have a consortium-based private blockchain. And you talked about economics. We felt 
very strongly that just the cost of mining um, and because we wanted to not just limit ourselves to just putting a, a flat record when the student graduates, we felt that students would constantly request for transcripts as they are going through the application process. We wanted the entire uh, student transcript, the entire data inside the platform. It's expensive. Um, you know, you want to put, uh, what is it, 7 uh, KB uh, today on, uh, on a Bitcoin network, it costs you about $150. So we decided to actually have a private blockchain run by the members. So it's a member-based private blockchain, and that significantly reduced our cost. From a security perspective, what we did, therefore, was to basically have you know, some, some data sitting on the blockchain, uh, but also uh, uh, data sitting uh, on an off-chain, which, uh, which is linked through the fingerprint mechanism back into the blockchain. So that, that basically helped us control our costs uh, the, the issues, however, the hiccups are more from getting registrars to embrace this concept uh, that, that this is good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you're used to basically keeping data inside your walls, uh, it was, what is it, 10 years ago trying to get them to put it in the cloud. Now you're trying to get them to basically put it in a blockchain. Mm -hmm. So this, I mean, those are, those are some of the pushbacks. Things moving a little too quickly for some people. <laughs> Uh, Chris, what, what is, um, you know, how do you convince uh, some of these institutions who have been doing things a certain way for so long to get on board with the technology? You know, what's your pitch when you go? <clears throat> well, it's different. It varies by region. Um, in the U.S. is very different from international. Internationally, lots of institutions are building, are moving from paper to their first digital system. And they want to use the latest and best technology. So the, that's a little bit easier. Um, in the US, they often buy things for more mundane reasons. They want uh, a better system of record to manage all of their credentials and to see analytics and to gain insight from what they're doing. And so they would be buying for maybe traditional enterprise IT reasons while at the same time being values aligned with records that actually belong to the student. Um, a lot of them too, a lot of schools see themselves as innovators. And early customers are, are, are actually a partner innovator. They help bring about and shape the way this technology evolves. Um, and, and so they see that as part of the school's role, um, as, a, as helping to affect change, as bringing intention to what is already underway. Um, we've got, I think, just over 10 minutes left. But I just want to see if there are any questions in the audience. So we want to make sure we have enough time for that. Um, does anybody have a question? I think we have a mic that can go around. No? I've got a shy audience. Okay, great. I'll just build off of Chris's comment for one quick second. Um, one of the things that's also opened the door here is just general adoption of cloud. Um, so as schools are moving their infrastructure to cloud computing, it gets easier to do things like blockchain on your own. Um, if you use Azure as an example, there's a template. You download, you install it, you've got blockchain. Um, so as schools have started to actually make that move to the cloud, they're starting to see that it's easier for them to pick up new advanced capabilities. The lift is not what it used to be if you had to go and buy complex systems. In a lot of cases, you can start building your own environments for blockchain or digital ledger with, in some cases, just a click. So the entry level for the technology is coming down. That doesn't mean that the schools are getting it right with their POC. So they're going in, they're trying it out, they're trying to see if it works. Um, and then they're going back to something like Learning Machine or, or other companies to get a really solid solution. But the knowledge and ability to just start with blockchain is now something that's in the hands of anyone who's using a cloud service. Um, so the barrier to entry on knowledge has come down. The awareness of Bitcoin as a blockchain platform, it's hard to miss. Uh, a lot of schools are investigating uh, Bitcoin payment systems for students. So it's coming in through different channels, uh, but it's definitely the awareness in the IT community within uh, higher education for sure has certainly gone up dramatically. Um, so just that awareness is going to pull through some of these other use cases and get people thinking about it in their day to day. So the barrier to entry has come down, but Manoj, I'm wondering how you measure success um, within your business because this is still early days. You're not going to see this, this mass move towards the technology. Well, I think there are two ways to measure success for us. Uh, one is whether we are going to be growing in revenues and uh, you know, paying our staff well and you know, those kind of things. But uh, 
we were st the reason that we got into this business is really to help these students to make those transitions, get into college or get into employment. And if we can do a much better job today than what, I mean, and these are easily measurable parameters. Um, let, you know, about 50% of the students at some of these schools were not even applying to college, were not even getting into college. And they were working with their local advisors. Now, if we can prove to these institutions two years later that 80% of these students went into college because the colleges found them or employers found them, that creates a big societal impact. The reverse transfer of credit, as an example, there's a, at least our statistics, we think that there's over a million students in Texas that probably graduate from, uh, transfer out from a two-year college, go into a four-year college, and then drop out without getting a degree. If we can, but they have completed the requisite number of courses to actually get an associate's degree. They just don't know it. The four-year institution just does not tell the two-year institution. The students don't know that. If we can give a million students an associate's degree, that's going to fundamentally change our society, at least in Texas, and, uh, and hopefully nationwide. So I think that the benefits to this technology, as, as someone said about the internet, you overestimate in the short run, and you underestimate its impact in the long run. And I suspect that's what's going to happen with blockchain, except that it's going to be far quicker. Hmm. Matt, you agree? I agree. I, it's, it's not a question of whether, it's a question of when. And we've been talking about summative credentials for the most part. There's also kind of formative education and assessment data that allow you to go deeper that for which there's also an application, not to mention things like co-curricular activities, other kinds of awards and experiences you have. You know, my point was simply, this isn't a decision that's happening in a vacuum, right? Universities have limited resources, limited technology resources. If I'm a registrar, I'm focused on retention and course scheduling and completion and a lot of really big things. So it's not to diminish the technical advantages that may exist, but I do think it puts a responsibility on us to not just introduce something that's next generation, technologically advanced, and opens the door for future applications as the ecosystem evolves, but to do it in the context of a pressing problem today that we can make a difference. And I happen to agree that that is more in the area of exchange and credit transfer than it is in the ability to award something that's permanent and verifiable, because reasonable people can disagree, but I think there are mechanisms that are at scale today. I mean, there's something like 35, 40 million PDF blue ribbon transcripts will be exchanged this year, used for graduate admissions, undergraduate admissions, and so on. Uh, what they don't do is allow the receiver to discover credit that exists for the applicant to be run against a smart contract that says you've earned an associate's degree in passing mm -hmm. and helps confer that degree. That is both a next generation technology and a new problem. Yeah, and Matt hits on a great point, which is graduation rates in the US today are about 50 to 60% for four year programs. Right, so you get a lot of students that start and fall out, never graduate, never get an actual diploma but they've built skills along that way. So as we start thinking about how do we um, evolve two-year or four-year programs and start thinking about how do I get some kind of credit as I'm going through that journey so that a student coming out of a program that's got student debt or whatever built up doesn't come out with nothing. Uh, that's an important problem for us to solve. And blockchain and being able to get micro-credentials for parts of courses that you're doing or leading towards certification where you can come back to it, you don't lose it, that's going to be an important piece for us to help improve those outcomes. Um, one last round out to audience. Go ahead. Can we get a mic over here? Uh, I have a question about um, continuous learning and lifetime learning. So what happens in that transition point from higher ed to your professional life and how you're developing your skills? goes from higher ed to now I got this certification, now I got this, you know, badge from somebody else that says I'm good at something else. Like what, what's your, what do you see happening in that space? Uh, well, the, the idea is, uh, I mean, there the are two ways to look at this, right? I mean, you can get all of your li lifetime achievements uh, in your locker that that is instantly available to you, right? And so you can see 
that you've got your high school credential, you've got maybe 10 different, you've got your .NET certification, you've got some design certification, you've got some community hours that you have done, you've got your college degree, you've got some employment internship programs, all of that could be instantly visible, would be instantly visible to you and you would be able to share it with any third party that you wanted to and that third party would know that it's all verified. And, and then, like we discussed, you can write all kinds of language and contracts on top of that by which the third parties could find you assuming that you're willing to consent to share your data. I think the heart of your question though is what is education? You know, because it's, as it's become unbundled and as people are going through continued learning, uh, continuous learning and workforce training, the idea that education is the coming of age for your experience on campus is a tiny part of education. I heard a stat, something that might account for 15% of higher education or something. <coughs> But then when you see people are constantly reskilling or upskilling, you know, education never stops, you know? And so, you know, trying to draw clean lines around that four-year experience is, um, I think schools need to start to see themselves better as part of this continuum and not the center of, of a universe. I think that's right. I, I, yeah. I would say, though, that technology may turn out not to be the most important thing when it comes to delivering that, because you've got a whole social dimension. I mean, it's just as possible that all these organizations issue new, you know, signatures to individuals, new identities, and you end up just as fragmented. So there's still a lot of social coordination that has to happen across the system. Blockchain just becomes a technology basis that that can happen. But Do we have any other questions? Go ahead. Um, I don't know if any of We're seeing, we're seeing adoption outside of the U.S. is faster than inside the U.S. And um, particularly the smaller the country, the higher the risk appetite. In larger countries like India and China, um, well, they have very, very different profiles. China's actually super interested in all this blockchain stuff. They just want to be in control of it. Um, so they're taking their own, their own approaches to it. Um, you know, I, but I think you'll see adoption happen slower the larger the country is in general. But if you look at the Commonwealth countries, the Caribbean countries, even some European countries, um, there's massive interest. Yeah, Canada's working on it. Uh, in the Nordics, it was either Sweden or Norway that put in a national policy to have a blockchain um, issuer at the national level. Malta, obviously, is there already. So you're getting probably faster adoption uh, outside the U.S. for sure. Um, in the U.S., it's been a mixed it's been a mixed bag. You're getting some schools. They're going deep in this. School systems are going deep in this. But nobody at the kind of state level or, or national level is going to do it. But lots of interest globally. Um, we'll see a number of different countries pop up with really good initiatives around it. Any other questions? Go ahead. I have one. So I'm coming from higher ed. So I have a question that's going to push maybe the last question just a little bit. So you talk to employers, and a lot of times they want to see the credentials, but it becomes an alphabet suit. And it's not a skill-based process. So have you looked at maybe what the next, so it's a two-step, looked at what the next level might be as you're developing a portfolio from someone where you've got some kind of workplace activity, redesign a website, something along those natures where you can capture that. And then second, are you seeing faster adoption from industry partners who are willing to accept it, or are you seeing better adoption, adoption from academics? Uh, I think on the first one, there's an interesting on-chain, off-chain discussion. So how much do you put on the blockchain itself and how much do you actually just connect to the blockchain with off-chain storage? Because you could have someone's complete um, set of written work stored off-chain connected to their credential that's on-chain. So you're going to see, I think, more hybrid scenarios where we're seeing multiple types of credentials connected to off-chain storage. Um, in, the, in the industries, it's a tougher thing. Like HR at most um, corporations is not really there yet. Um, so you're going to see this kind of slow evolution, but there's going to be a point where there is some use case that pops up where people say, oh, that's the one, and you know, that's gonna be the trigger. Um, so you know, from, a, from a corporate standpoint, we're seeing more on, the, more on the validation side right now. It hasn't been fully integrated into recruiting and hiring practices yet, but it's gonna get there. You go out 10 years, uh, it would be unlikely that you'd see a non-digital ledger-based first screen pass through candidates. 
Um, we've got just a, a few seconds left, but I'm wondering if we can end on this question, which is, you know, how far out are we until we realize the full potential of blockchain in this space, and what does that look like? Matt, do you want to take that? So, I mean, I'm just temperamentally one of those people who thinks change in education is always, I mean, it's maybe the inverse of the, you know, internet, um, where it's going to take a lot longer than you think. So, um, I think when a typical student has meaningful educational data that has a blockchain component is still easily 10 years away. Hmm. Great. 10 years away. We'll leave it on that. I, I don't know if that's an optimistic <laughs> note, but. I'm probably the most years. conservative. I don't know. <laughs> Others may think it's happening. I don't know. The, the comment on lifelong learning, I think, is going to drive it the most. Like, I think connecting what you do in K-12 with higher ed with what you do as professional certification hmm. and what you kind of do as a skills fill up once employers start seeing that as the valuable piece of the puzzle, that's when you're going to get adoption moving ahead the fastest. And it might come through professional certification. It might come through you know, tech qualification. Don't know what the channel is that's going to drive it, but it's when the kind of employer side starts really kind of I think it's the demand that. side that drives it, and then it tips very quickly. I think that's fair. Yeah, I think the adopt rate of adoption is going to vary drastically between sectors. I think there's some subsectors that will ad adopt it very quickly, and then others that will take 10 years, um, just like many digital tools. Okay, we'll have to leave it on that note. Thank you so much, guys, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you.